everyone, this is Fish Geek Girl back with another video. Um, I've decided to step out of the fish room for this one, at least for the talking portion. I discovered that there was quite a bit, well I didn't just discover, people told me there was quite a bit of um, background noise with the air pumps and stuff. I think you'll find with a lot of fish YouTubers that's kind of a common thing. I will try as much as possible to deliver most of the like bread and butter and like the, the basic info, the, 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 the stuff you really want to like hold on to. I'm going to try to deliver that more outside of the fish room just so you guys can understand me a little better. Um, I do have a microphone and I'm hoping that's all good. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to get into today's topic. So today's topic is going to be pH um, and tank crashes specifically and how you can avoid them. This is a very common issue people encounter. Um, it's commonly known that cycling an aquarium is important. Um, what's not as well understood is that after you cycle the aquarium, things can still crash and you can still have ammonia spikes. And what happens is that people tend to get complacent and uh, are maybe too busy and aren't doing enough water changes and maybe don't realize that their pH is getting a little dangerously low. So, um, We'll start by getting into a little bit about the uh, nitrogen cycle. So I'm not a newbie. I've been keeping fish for most of my life as I've already described in several videos now. Um, but I sometimes don't test my water like I should. Um, and a lot of people when they start out are the same. They don't test their water because they don't really know that the water is its own element and its own uh, thing to, to look after. Um, so, you know, people who are accustomed to keeping dogs and cats and, and, uh, small animals like guinea pigs and things, um, it's just very sensible that you wipe everything clean, you bleach things and you, you do that and you clean up their poop and remove it and sanitize. And what's not as well understood with fish is that, um, doing that actually kills your biological filtration. Um, and that's your best friend. And that's actually what allows the aquarium to be livable for the fish. So, um, yeah, I'm not a newbie to tank cycling. Tank cycling is the process of slowly stocking an aquarium. Um, you can do it fishless cycling. It's a little trickier that way. Um, or you could just get a few fish. Uh, when I worked retail, uh, you know, if you had a 10 gallon tank, you might add one or two fish. Um, and then just sort of carefully tend to them through that process and then being careful not to add too many fish at any given time and that resulted in a lot of like people bringing in water samples and that's sort of like you know, you know show me show me your car facts like, show me your water facts like your water just prove that your water's healthy for your fish and what i mean by that is that um what fish do constantly um is that they're producing ammonia uh whether it's just by eating and pooping or, um, you know, or, or just excreting um, other waste products, they are producing ammonia constantly. Um, and ammonia is toxic. If you've ever had ammonia build up, you know, if you're going to clean the litter box, you have a cat and the ammonia is very strong and it almost burns your nostrils and your eyes if you let it go too bad, you know. So fish are being burned in a similar way um, and it can actually damage their gills and, and uh, their body and cause them to become very, very sick very fast. Um, so the thing is with their ammonia though, you don't smell it as much, you know, they're in a glass box and you have a lid and water's like almost an alien world and you don't know that that's happening. Maybe sometimes they'll sniff the water and it smells a little, a little musty or, or bad. Um, but the point is that this is, this is, they're producing the ammonia constantly, um, whether you see it or not, whether you see the fish poop or not, whether you <laughs> realize it's happening and what you rely on then is the filtration and, um, the buildup of, uh, a colony of beneficial bacteria. And a lot of times that'll happen. They'll colonize the, uh, substrate and they'll colonize, um, the biological media. A lot of times when you buy your filters or hang on the backs or your, um, canister filters, they will have porous media, um, or sponges and things. And, and, um, 
a lot of times it, it is in the filter because they're a type of aerobic bacteria, so they need oxygen to really thrive um, and, and to colonize appropriately. So um, when it's like right in your Cascade filter or anything like the, the if you ever had the BioWheel filters, you know, you're just constantly turning and aerating that bacteria. Um, and yeah, it is a little bit of a slow process. Um, and uh, testing your water is your best friend to know to know where that's at and to know when the ammonia crash course if you are new the nitrifying bacteria which is a beneficial bacteria i'm talking about um turns ammonia into uh, nitrite which is still toxic but less toxic than ammonia and then it'll turn it ultimately there, there's two different kinds of bacteria one will turn it into nitrite and then the next one will turn it into uh, nitrate and nitrate is considered the least harmful you could have uh, detectable levels of nitrate and your fish can be perfectly healthy um, and a lot of this is also uptaken by by plants and things like that so the, the goal is to have your bacteria so robust that any amount of um, ammonia that your fish are pumping out, the bacteria is converting immediately so that it's not becoming toxic. And so what, what I want to get into today is uh, uh, a trap that I fell into recently, which is the trap of thinking, well, you're cycled, you're good, and just doing water changes and, and not really thinking about it much further than that. But when you're someone like me, when you breed fish, you have 20 or 30 fish in an aquarium. Now that's considered kind of an overstocked situation. So what happens is that you're having a lot more ammonia production, you're having a lot more of this nitrification. And um, the thing that I didn't realize was that um, my water <laughs> out of the tap, I thought it was a lot harder. I thought the carbonate hardness and uh, the general hardness were higher than they were. Um, and uh, I tested it recently and found out the carbon harness was four, four degrees. Um, I can go into that probably <laughs> uh, a little more in depth about testing your water, but just a little plug. API test kits, those are what I use. Um, your KH and GH test kit combo. Um, it's really important to know where your carbonate harness is, and the reason I say that is because that's considered your buffering capacity. And what I mean is that um, that is what keeps your pH from dropping precipitously um, as nitrification happens. And nitrification happens, um, nitrification happens for every like molecule of ammonia that is processed by your um, bacteria. There's like a hydrogen that is like uh, released, like ionized. And what happens is sometimes over time that'll, well, not sometimes, this is what happens inevitably. If you don't do water changes to replenish minerals and things, uh, over time, this will cause your pH to drop. So the longer you go between water changes and the um, lower your resistance, your pH is, your carbonate hardness is, um, your buffering capacity is, the more likely it is to be susceptible to pH crash. I had to do a little bit of research on this because I am not a chemist. I actually had to take some notes on that myself because I understood what was happening. I'll try to break it down to you in like basic terms, but like I didn't want to sound stupid. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so basically, um, over time, what I'm trying to say is that the after even after tank a cycle, if you go too long between water changes, um, your pH tends to get lower and lower and lower, and this is a gradual process. And as that happens, ammonia tends to also become like ionized. And uh, at a lower pH, it tends to be a, a different form and rise to high levels. And this is not really converted with the bacteria as much. It isn't really um, nitrified and, and it's just kind of a free ammonia um, that isn't toxic at, until it's a much higher level. Um, so what happens is that as your water acidifies and acidifies and acidifies, you're not noticing this, you're not seeing it happen. You don't know that the pH is going lower and lower. Um, the ammonium is going higher and higher and uh, eventually that does become toxic. And then once it becomes toxic, it's kind of a hard thing to get yourself out of. And then you think the remedy would be doing large water changes, but what will happen if you do the large water changes is that you'll suddenly, it'll suddenly convert. It'll become uh, actually a much more toxic form of ammonia and then um, your fish will really suffer. 
So but when you see the tank crash happening, the best remedy is uh, gradual adjustments, but the best thing of all is to prevent it. And that's something that I didn't quite consider when I took on all these fish. When my aquatics department had to be shuttered, I took on a lot of fish. I started working retail to make ends meet and I got busy. I started breeding stuff and filling tanks with fry and I was doing bare bottom tanks. Now I find tanks that have gravel or some kind of substrate are more resistant to a pH crash. And this is because a lot of the um, substrates can sometimes leach minerals into the water. Um, I'm gonna go into one of my rem favorite remedies, which is crushed coral for buffering your water. So I find that the more substrate and other elements you have to sort of grow the bacteria and all of that keeps your tank just way healthier. But I've been doing bare bottom, like two and a half gallons and things like that and cramming lots of fry in them. So I had a lot of tank crashes and uh, when I did the water test, I realized, oh my God, the pH is six, which is acidic and the ammonia is sky high. API test kits, something to know is that uh, the ammonia tests will test all forms of ammonia. Uh, ionized or not. Something I know about that is that if your tap water comes out saying it has ammonia um, a little bit, it's probably not really in a super harmful form or at least not in a high enough concentration to be an issue. But one thing that I found is kind of a godsend in this whole situation is uh, some Seachem products and I'm going to recommend those a lot. Specifically, there's an ammonia alert and a pH alert uh, combo products. Um, I'm going to show you those in use so you can see what it looks like. But those are basically little things that stick a suction on the inside of your tank and actively monitor your pH and ammonia and will change colors so that you in real time can see what's happening and be alerted um, without having to break out your test kit. And this, uh, it's amazing. I wish I had it on all my tanks. Um, now realistically, do I know? So basically, <laughs> to avoid tank crashes, let's see some recommendations for you guys. Don't overstock your tank. <laughs> do your regular water changes 25% every week um, or more. Just keep up on it. And then to keep pH from dropping too quickly, you can buffer the water and add things to raise the carbonate hardness as long as it's not going to like you know, raise your pH, you know, to be too high for whatever you're trying to keep. But I usually get little bags. You can put them in your filter, um, filter bags. You can just drop them in the tank if you want, or you can just do a crushed coral substrate. I find that that helps buffer things out so that those tanks, what I noticed was that my tanks that had crushed coral didn't crash. Like the ammonia was higher, but it didn't acidify as much. And I was able to sort of remedy it uh, before it became a catastrophe. Anywho, what I found also is that if you have multiple aquariums, if you find yourself in a pH crash situation, you know, like you're tempted to do large water changes, but by doing so, you're going to make the ammonium convert really fast and quickly into something that's way too toxic. What ha The reason it's too toxic, right, is because your bacteria has slowly weakened over time when the pH is lower and the ammonium is, is the ammonia is more ionized and it's not being converted as much um, is more free and just not not as harmful to the fish right but also the bacteria just isn't using as much of it so it kind of dies off a little bit but what happens is that when you suddenly raise the pH, your bacteria colonies are so weak at that point that they're not able to convert fast enough. But I found a workaround that I found is that if you can take a filter from an established tank that's much healthier, or like handfuls of gravel or crushed coral from an established tank, and shove that in there and then do your large water changes, world of a difference. I had a tank of Gadead fry, it looked like on death's door. I grabbed a bunch of crushed coral from an established tank that was like using a substrate and then did my water changes then and they were it was like a miracle the next day they were almost 100 percent healthier and this is like a you know almost like an inoculation right of your probiotics we talk about <laughs> and you know your gut and everything else probiotics are life-saving a game changer really i think uh and when it comes to you know aquariums um a lot of times i say they are the original bioactive enclosure which is you know i get scoffed at sometimes by the reptile people when i say that because i keep reptiles as well but it's true 
you're very much um, living in this biological um, stasis um, with your aquarium. So, um, anywho, that was my experience. I had several tanks crash. I had lots of celestial pearl banyo breeders that I lost. I had a whole tank of long fin fry that I lost everything but one and uh, almost broke me. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that was that was rough. But now I'm adding crushed coral because I did a bit testing on the uh, tank or on the water coming out of my tap. And I thought because the pH coming out of the tap was like eight plus, oh my God, the carbon hardness must be so high. I thought it was more resistant to tank crashes and I was wrong because the carbonate hardness was about four. And when it comes to uh, carbonate hardness, when I was working in the aquarium industry more, um, you want three or better. If you're two, you're very much on the verge of a crash. Now you can always test the carbonate hardness yourself if you're like, oh my God, is it happening? Is it, is it gonna happen? If you know your carbonate hardness out of the tap is higher and you go and test your water, and get your KH test kit. Now these are, you count the number of drops, right? So when you say your KH is three or better, that means it's three drops until it changes color from blue to yellow. Um, but if you put it in like one drop and it's yellow and you're like, normally when I test my water, I put it in five drops and it's, you know, before it changes. Um, what that tells you is that you almost have a crisis uh, about to happen and you need to remedy that by doing more water changes again gradual you don't want to raise the ph too high and then also adding crushed coral if you haven't things that i'll also recommend uh Seachem makes a great product now we know prime is like the <laughs> aquarist best friend when it comes to dechlorinating and like neutralizing ammonia um, but it doesn't work as long as uh, a amgard which is a different product by Seachem and that'll actually um, neutralize and, and render ammonia less toxic for several days. I use a lot of Amgard when I'm trying, when I've been trying to get through this. Because um, what I find is that if you're trying to ride this out, if the fish get too damaged by the ammonia, sometimes, like I said, you do the, you do the inoculation of bacteria and a big water change and the next day you're right as rain, maybe. But if you weren't as fortunate to be able to have other aquariums to take from to do that, um, the longer they're sitting in that toxic ammonia, um, the more they are likely to get um, secondary infections. I had a lot of fish that I was treating originally because I, I started seeing slime coat was getting damaged. Like it was getting, they were getting like kind of weird spots and growths and funguses and things and I'm like oh dear lord there's something happening it's killing all my fish no it was a pH crash the ammonia was getting way too toxic the ammonium or the ammonia either way getting way too toxic was harming the fish um, by the toxicity and then they were getting sick from that so I found another product that works really well is called stress guard um, <laughs> also by Seachem my cat is saying hi <laughs> stress guard basically help bolster their um, slime coat in the interim so yeah i am just now getting past i had probably seven or eight tanks crash it was chaotic i thought i was gonna lose everything um i'm just now getting past it here's my cat here's keo he's coming in for the snuggles what a good boy anywho i'm just getting past it um, and thankfully I was able to save my longfin. My longfin breeders were never at risk because they were four in a tank. Um, so they never were overstocked. So their pH never crashed. But I learned my lesson. I put my uh, ammonia alert in their tank. That way I'm going to get a visual indication when that ammonia becomes toxic immediately. And I'll know to remedy the situation. Can't recommend those products enough if you're having those issues. Um, and then if you're a fish breeder like me and you have tons and tons of tanks of fry, keeping up on those water changes, like yes, adding the crushed coral helps, but keeping up on those water changes is paramount. And uh, back when I worked in the uh, a fish nursery of sorts, uh, when I worked in our fish store <laughs> that um, bred a lot of its own fish in house, um, you had to do water changes like clockwork every day. There'd be like 50 fish in like a 20 gallon, right? Maybe more, um, live bears, bettas, what have you. You had to do water changes like clockwork to keep the pH from, from crashing and to keep the mineral content up. I like adding crushed coral because it kind of slowly buffers water. It's not like an instant, like 
oh my god, the water's instantly harder. Um, it slur slowly dissolves and slowly um, will buffer your water. Um, and so I I love crushed coral. If you have tanks with like quarry cats and things, you, you know, it might be a little abrasive for their barbels. So then putting in like a little um, filter bag is kind of my solution and then have the sand. Um, there's a ragonite sand. Again, I feel like it might be a little tough on those guys, but um, that is an option. So uh, hopefully that made sense to you guys. I <laughs> just kind of went on a rant there. But now that I've gotten a lot of the talking done, I figure I'm going to go show you some of the um, products in action, specifically the alert products, and then also some updates on some fish and some things that are happening in my fish room, because uh, why not? So uh, stay tuned. So here I wanted to show you guys um, kind of a tank that's still, one of my few tanks that's still kind of being uh, remedied right now. Um, this was a Celestial Prolanio breeding tank, um, and I lost a lot of, well, I didn't lose a lot of fish. What happened was I, I sort of, another thing you can do to help the situation if you have a tank crash is you can move the fish to an established tank that's healthy and doesn't have toxic ammonia levels and acclimate them to, you know, or get them to that. Um, they'll do a lot better. I started breaking up this group, so a lot of the, um, fish that were in this breeding group got split into several five and ten gallons, and was trying different things and found that I was able to stabilize them better that way. So, um, you know, removing some of the source of ongoing ammonia helps. Um, but these are the two products here. You can see the ammonia alert, the pH alert. Uh, my house little clutters have to go around here. Um, and you can see, I mean, the pH alert, it's a good indication of where things are. Um, obviously the brighter yellow it is or orange, um, oh no, that's a problem. Um, I would say this is not great, but it's also, um, it could be a lot worse. Um, the, you can see here though on the ammonia alert, um, it's in definitely an alert mode. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't call it toxic, but it might be, like, I need to do some stuff here. I'm probably going to add some AmGuard. Um, I might inoculate with some, um, better bacteria sources. I was trying to use cups of gravel here from other tanks, but, um, it's clearly not been the best. I also did put some uh, zeolite in there. I think zeolite probably works a lot better if it's in the actual filter, and uh, I use sponge filters, so it's probably not great. Um, but yeah, so Amgard and Tresgard would probably be your friend in the situation, um, gradually boosting the pH. Um, these guys, unfortunately, did they do have kind of some clamped up fins. Um, so they've been definitely, I, I think it went too long before I caught that the tank crash was happening. So I've been trying to get them back to health. Another thing is that when you're having this happen, definitely, definitely don't overfeed. Definitely your fish are probably too stressed to eat a ton anyway. Um, so definitely cut back on the feeding a lot. So, yeah. Here is a tank that never really crashed. Um, at least not to the detriment of the fish. Um, it didn't seem to harm anybody, no losses in this tank whatsoever. And you can see I have crushed coral as the substrate. <laughs> so I was like, huh, it's weird, all my tanks are crashing except this one. Um, well, it's because the pH was not dropping as precipitously. Um, things were a little more balanced. Um, you can see even the plants. So another thing I want to point out, um, when tank crashes happen, I lost almost all of my mosses and hornworts and things in other tanks because they just melted. Um, it just became, the, well, they probably couldn't uptake any nutrients because they weren't being converted into nitrate. The bacteria was dying off. They just, they melted. They absolutely melted. And then they convert, you know, obviously when they melt and die, they're, they're kind of like their own source of ammonia, rotting dead plants. So that was a whole freaking mess. I had to buy a bunch of new Java moss and stuff for the swap. Um, I, I did do a swap recently. I uh, was pretty happy actually. It went really well. Um, but anyway, yeah, this is a 10 gallon, um, but I did want to point out something. Ooh, I did want to point out something. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a couple little legs back there. So I have a new creature in my fish area. It's called an agla. Um, I am going to have to spook them out because these are um, kind of like a freshwater squat lobster, what they call them sometimes. Uh, they're a very unique uh, organism. They're actually very closely related to hermit crabs. Um, and they're found in, in South America. Um, 
and they're usually in cooler running water so um, I put them in this tank because like I said it's been the most stable and Agla are actually pretty expensive they're retail for about 30 to 40 bucks a piece I've got three of them in here right now I had four I lost one um, but that wasn't that was just like a it, it didn't last 24 hours um, sometimes when they're imported things happen um, anyway yeah let me spook him out for ya oh there it goes sorry for all of the mess in here I had to dig these guys up um, it looks like I have two I'm hoping it's a pair um, but yeah I thought I had three so for a minute there I was kind of frustrated one of them dug into the driftwood so I couldn't tell it was still there uh, oh anyway so these are like a freshwater squat lobster um, if I don't have a lot of success with these um, I may return them back to my friend over at Fishy Biz, I will very likely be doing some videos and co collaborations with him, uh, my friend Ethan. So shout out if you're in Farmington, check out Fishy Biz. Uh, they get in really cool stuff. Um, these actually came from uh, Fugu Puff. If you go on Instagram, um, they bring in a lot of rare, unusual critters. So these are Agla. Like I said, they were uh, native to uh, South America. Um, they are very, very exceedingly rare in the hobby, and um, I didn't know they existed <laughs> until this year. Uh, I thought about doing a video spotlight on them, but I may scratch that for now, just depending on how these guys do um, and how um, how Ethan and I are, or Ethan does with them, because he may try to breed them too. Uh, there has been documented breeding. Um, these guys are also known as like cockroach crabs, and. Uh, uh, they, they, they apparently are bred similarly to uh, crayfish. Um, the thing is, um, they do like a cooler. Um, I was going to set up a tank for them downstairs that's like more um, similar to their native habitat with like large stones and things to hide under. Maybe a, a power head to simulate some stream movement and then of course it's a lot cooler in my basement. Um, so we'll see if I get there. Um, just been so hectic. I was just, I had to jump on the opportunity to get these guys. I've been kind of obsessed with them for a while. So, uh, but yeah, that's new. And I threw them in here because this tank was just more stable. Like I said, the crushed coral. Um, another, another thing is that crushed coral is actually really, really good for releasing minerals and things into the water that are necessary for things like, uh, um, crustaceans to build their exoskeleton. So, you know, uh, crayfish and things like that, it's very important that they have uh, good mineral content in their water. So, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't feature these guys. Um, like I said, I did pop on an ammonia alert on one of these tanks, just as like security measure. And you can see on this Celestial Pearl Danio tank, it's actually in the safe range. Uh, fun story, if you are trying to do fishless cycling at all, this is actually a great tool to kind of gauge where your ammonia is, because when you dose, so when you do fishless cycling, you introduce ammonia to the tank by artificial means and not by the animals themselves. Um, so I used to just culture sponges around the clock and I'd pop one of these in the tank, um, and then I'd just dose with uh, like five mLs of uh, just straight like ammonia like you'd buy off the grocery store, or not off the, the cleaning product shelf. Um, never ever, obviously, mix ammonia and bleach. Anyway, doesn't need to be said, but yeah. Uh, but the, when you use ammonia to dose tanks and stuff, this little tool here, the ammonia alert's kind of handy because it'll turn toxic like for hours and hours and then eventually you'll see it convert over to say, and so that's how you know it's being converted. Um, so yeah, that's really cool. Uh, these are my hay long fin babies. I don't have babies anymore. These guys are getting pretty old. Um, so that's the female. Um, she, the females do have it more subtle, but there's my boys in the back. Um, they're, they're showing a little bit of age, but they're still breeding. I was actually going to pull, like I said, they get new mosses and stuff. Um, so I was able to avoid issues in this tank because it's slowly stocked. And then I added my baggie of crushed coral once I realized my carbonate hardness is low. So no losses on these guys. Really, really thankful for that. These are my pride and joy. 
and uh, yeah, but I had to get some new moss. I also have some boosts in there. I got a nice piece of uh, flowering boost um, from my friend, again, Ethan at Fishy Biz, so check them out if you're in Farmington. Uh, if you're in Michigan at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, one little last side note with these Alert products, they're good for uh, about a year. So you'll want to replace them annually. Uh, the two packs only cost like 12, 13 bucks for the ammonia alert and the pH alert, at least where I was getting them uh, at the local fish store. So um, can't recommend these enough. These are great um, life-saving, fish-saving products uh, because when you're busy and stuff, this will tell you what's going on um, faster than you can test it. And yeah, you won't miss issues that way. So, yeah. So, oh, just wanted to show some of the fry of my CPDs that I believe are exhibiting some long fin. Um, like I said, I lost one whole tank of long fins and that was pretty friggin' devastating. Um, my camera does not want to focus on these guys because they're moving so fast. But, um, yeah, maybe, maybe. But they're starting to color out, some of the boys in here, and they're, they're looking like their fins are, are getting longer. Um, what I've found with this, with this particular trait is that it takes a little time for them to the males to mature and look like awesome. I know when I first saw my original long fins as babies, I didn't know what to make of it. Their fins just looked weird, but not like long, long. And then as they aged, they kind of grew into it and then grew really nice long fins. Um, Kia was protesting per usual. So yeah, these are <laughs> these guys are doing good. There's a couple little belly slider wonky ones in there, but um, but otherwise. That is, this tank is great. I had a crushed coral. I'm doing water changes on this. I'm actually going to bump these guys up soon because there's probably a touch too many of them in there. Um, and I don't want to roll the dice on that any more than I already have. Uh, there's some sparkle blue rice fish, which are doing great. Um, basically close to breeding size, believe it or not. Um, and here's some more CPDs. Um, just delightful, lovely little fish. I'm so happy that I didn't lose them all. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be cranking them out into the new year. Okay, stepping away from the fish room again to kind of do my um, end of this video. If you tune in this far, thank you for listening. I know I ramble a lot. This was not much of a demo video, so much as uh, ranting, talking, lecturing, but I, I hope that it was fun to listen to. I, I definitely enjoy talking and when I get uh, on a tangent and when I get on to a subject that I'm really passionate about, I just kind of go and go and go. Um, you may notice I have uh, <laughs> some plywood cut. Uh, so today I cut some plywood and I'm actually turning some of my reptile space into more of a fish space. Like I said, I am going to be cranking out celestial pearl danios um, into the new year. That's my goal. Um, especially the long fins, just because I want to share them with all of you guys. Um, and just, it's just so rewarding to <laughs> raise these fish. I did do a swap recently and uh, I think it went really well. And I'm just really excited to be doing this on my own and having complete ownership. And uh, yeah, so um, like and comment, um, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you next time.